Have you checked the Long days and pleasant nights, fellow travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the towers. Jaime in Fuego, and if it please you, join me here for a bit of palaver on Hail to Stephen King. That is Reezy, y'all. So very stoked to have you here, and obviously, Bevanitos, and welcome to the Horror Show. This is the weekly worship I do every single Saturday. Cy King being my favorite author, as you can see by that Tower of Tomes behind me. Uh, it took me about seven years to go through everything in published order, but it is always a pleasure to deviate a wee bit and talk about adaptations of El Rey, which is what we are doing today, because here in the month of Noviembre, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of Definitely one of the most celebrated Psy King adaptations of all time. We'd be talking Rob Reiner's Misery. That's right, an iconic performance from Kathy Bates. She won both a Golden Globe and an Academy Award for Best Actress. Uh, James Caan is great in it too, but really, with the exception of two older characters who are in this Colorado town that uh, are a part of the narrative just a wee bit, it's really a two-person show at this particular point, and uh, it's a very captivating film, worthy of all of the accolades and praise, and most notably, uh, as Annie Wilkes, one of the most iconic Psy King villains that he has ever put to paper, and who was elevated into even further notoriety with this performance. And here I'm actually holding the uh, Shout Factory, Scream Factory, because, you know, they're Shout Factory, and then they have their little subsidiary under their umbrella called Scream Factory, where they do science fiction, thrillers, horror, you know, just basically genre sort of stuff. I think some fantasy seeps in there from time to time, too, but specifically Scary Shizzle, and this is a new 4K transfer of the film. It has a couple new special features, which were pretty dope. I watched all of the supplemental stuff on here. It has... Everything from the previous, um, you know, uh, higher definition release, which, uh, I mean, there's tons of stuff. There's an audio commentary with Rob Reiner, a separate audio commentary with William Goldman, uh, Misery Loves Company, which is a great featurette from, I think, the early 2000s, if I remember correctly. Uh, Mark Shaman has a bit called the Musical Misery Tour, which is funny. Play on words. And then you also have, aside from, you know, the expected trailers and stuff like that, there's all of these little separate vignettes. They're like, it's like two to like six minutes in length talking about mental illness and stalkers and celebrity stalkers in this case and it's actual like Los Angeles law enforcement people and uh, people in the judicial process, you know, prosecutors and stuff like that. So it's very interesting hearing a full-on expert's perspective on all of the different traits that Annie Wilkes exudes in all of her fearsomeness. But besides the 4K, if you're thinking about actually picking this up, um, You've got this new interview with Rob Reiner, which is extensive. It's like about 30 minutes long. And you also have a great new interview exclusive to this release, just like the Reiner one that I just mentioned, with special effects and makeup artist Greg Nicotero. Because, yeah, Mr. Walking Dead himself, who has, like, hundreds of credits to his IMDb at this particular point, worked on so many iconic horror and... Honestly, unbeknownst to me, as he talks about in this, like, 30-minute interview, various other stuff. The fact that Nicotero also worked on, like, City Slickers, and he worked on... At the same time he was working on this, he was working on a film with Carl Reiner, Rob's father. So, I mean, there is, like, probably about three hours nearly, at least more than two, of special features on this disc, which is really badass. But let's talk about this film real quick, shall we? So, released November 30th of 1990, uh, Misery was a both critical and box office success. The budget was 20 million. It made like 60, 61.3 million at the worldwide box office. So um, I do believe they spent less on marketing back then in comparison with what we see now with so much digital marketing that happens through online sources and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I, I would say the marketing as opposed to in this day and age where they're like, yep, you've got the budget and then you have to double down for marketing. So a $20 million movie in this day and age would probably cost about 30 to 40 million at the end of the day to the studio when you factor in all the promotional aspects and stuff like that. But yeah, so it was it was profitable and it was also, it wasn't laboriously long like some King movies in the later 90s would be. That's not to knock, you know, Shawshank or Green Mile or, you know, some of the miniseries that became the flavor of the day as we, you know, went into the 90s with King and saw stuff like, you know, It and Stand and I guess 
Now that I think about it, it was it it was on TV. I want to say like right around this same time, if I'm correct. Uh, I think it was November of '90 as well. But nonetheless, you guys know that between the stand and Tommy Knockers and Langlers and all this other stuff, the the longer form King adaptations became much more popular. But yeah, this is a lean mean. It's like hundred minutes and change, and uh, it's it's well paced. It moves along very briskly. It is captivating, and uh, j just I've already reviewed the book Misery on here, so I'm not going to go into extensive comparisons or anything of that nature. But the book Misery, which was originally supposed to be a Bachman book, came out June 8th of 1987. Um, obviously, we know about the Con and Bates because that's what we're here to talk about today. But there was also an on stage version, a number of them, as a matter of fact. So in the 90s, there was a production that was put. Uh, together in London, and then there was also a revival of that same version of the story on stage in the 2000s. Then there was a uh, William Goldman play that I really wish I could find some like bootleg footage of it or something because so Goldman who actually you know wrote the script for this and worked on various other stuff that I'll touch on here in a moment but he actually took his film and adapted it as a stage play that had Laurie Metcalf I believe yeah from uh she, well she's been in lots of stuff most people probably know her from like Roseanne for instance but um and Bruce Willis so Bruce Willis as Paul Sheldon and uh Laurie Metcalf as uh Annie Wilkes I would love to have seen that but uh and then that was in turn adapted into two different Finnish plays uh Pina Bean Pina I don't know it's P I I N A it's a Finnish term that basically translates to torment so <laughs> keep that in mind so uh, yeah I mean and obviously we all know that uh, Lizzie Kaplan was tremendous as a young Annie Wilkes in the second season of Castle Rock that was recently canceled so I mean misery is very obviously with all of the different uh, incarnations, one of King's most prolific properties, but I don't think all of these other iterations and versions of it would have happened if not for this terrific movie that was directed by Rob Reiner. And Rob Reiner, uh, before this, he had previously adapted Stephen King's The Body into Stand By Me, which was very celebrated and kind of showed people that he wasn't just doing goofy stuff, you know, like Spinal Tap, although I adore Spinal Tap, it's one of the funniest films ever made, obviously. Uh, but yeah, that was what really made people think, okay, this isn't just Carl Reiner's kid. This isn't just the meathead from All in the Family. This dude actually, he can tell compelling uh, stories with big time dramatic weight and stuff. And so, um, and then he also founded Castle Rock Entertainment with a couple buddies of his who would go on to make tons of Stephen King adaptations. So besides this one, there was also Needful Things. They did Shawshank Redemption. They did Dolores Claiborne. They did The Green Mile. They did Hearts in Atlantis. They did Dreamcatcher. I mean, but they also did tons of other stuff, you know, just to keep that in mind. So it, it wasn't just the, I mean, Castle Rock, yeah, the King connection, obviously, but it wasn't just the, you know, El Rey show completely. And so, you know, props to Reiner and, and Castle Rock for putting this together. But William Goldman, the screenwriter for this, who also has a lot of King connections, you know, he would go on to be a consultant on uh, Kathy Bates' return to the King verse in Dolores Claiborne. But he also wrote the script for Hearts in Atlantis. He wrote the script for Dreamcatcher. But his story career, Goldman's that is, goes as far back as the 60s with Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He also did the original Stepford Wives. He worked on A Princess Bride with Rob Reiner before doing Misery. He also would later go on after Misery to work on A Few Good Men with Rob Reiner. He also did a few of my favorite 90s, like, uh, you know, like thrillers and uh, kind of like thriller horror stuff. He did The Ghost in the Darkness with Joel Schumacher. Uh, he scripted Absolute Power, that great Clint Eastwood movie. Uh, and he also did Maverick, Mel Gibson, James Garner. I love the hell out of that movie. And so Goldman, what a terrific screenwriter. He, he put together a very compelling tale that was very faithful to the original story, you know, the King source material. But I also felt like some of the nuances he added, most notably with like the, the local law enforcement guy and his wife, who is his deputy, and just the investigation of trying to figure out what happened with Paul Sheldon, and also the Liberace stuff, which is not in the book either. Like, you know, he really, he, he trimmed some of the fat, but on top of that, he worked so well with Rob and with uh, Barry Sonnenfeld, who shot the movie, who was the cinematographer, who would go on to do tons of stuff himself. But, and I mean, Sonnenfeld, before uh, directing the two Adams Family movies and the Three Men in Black movies and Get Shorty, 
great director in his own right, but he was a cinematographer beforehand, and so he had worked with the Coens on, like, Blood Simple, Miller's Crossing, Raising Arizona. Uh, what else had he done? Uh, he also did uh, When Terry Met Sally, so that was his first time, presumably, collaborating on a film with Rob Reiner. But, I mean, Goldman, with this great script and so many tense scenes in this film, I mean, it was scripted terrifically, it was shot terrifically, and directed terrifically by Reiner. Like, this was just a well-oiled machine, and then bringing in an unknown Kathy Bates, who had really only done stage work before, and Khan, James Khan, I mean, playing Paul Sheldon, who was supposed to be this renowned writer who a lot of people don't just know his name, but they recognize his face. You needed somebody like Khan, you know, who had done, like, Rollerball and uh, Godfather, obviously, and a shitload of other stuff. So having an unknown as Wilkes made complete sense. It was at Barry Sonnenfeld's recommendation to Rob Reiner to cast her. And obviously, we know how terrific she was, how chilling, and yet he sympathized with her a little bit for whatever reason. I don't as much as other people, but I... I understand why you might feel bad for this weird, deranged woman, you know, to a degree. And so, yeah, I mean, you had so much talent all culminating together for this film, and it's no wonder it's as celebrated as it is, and as revered as it, as it is, and I just rewatched it last night before reviewing this, and uh, it's it's it holds up so goddamn well. It is just terrific. One thing that does bum me out a little bit, is that they did not actually shoot in Colorado. They shot in California and Nevada, so I'm, I'm assuming those snowy exteriors were somewhere in Northern California or uh, somewhere in Nevada where it gets cold enough, obviously. So that's a little, at least a little bit of a bummer. And then they shot in Hollywood, you know, for, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, like the in-house sequences and stuff like that. But uh, you also have to give a lot of credit to Mark Shaman. Now, I my first orientation with Mark Shaman was the South Park movie, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. Shut your fucking face, I'm fucking, you know, stuff like that. He he worked tremendously with Trey Parker and the team to put together tons of memorable tunes for that film. But aside from that, he also uh, adapted Hairspray, the John Waters film, into a stage musical. I, in some ways, prefer the musical film to the original John Waters Hairspray film with Ricky Lake. A lot of people find that blasphemous, but the songs are just so catchy and so tremendously put together. And I mean, Shaman has worked on tons and tons of films, dozens upon dozens of them. But for this one, as he discusses in some of the supplemental material, it's fascinating because it was like 89, 90 when this film was being put together. And he, he got, he's one of those people, there's some who like to uh, score music and compose before they get the film. Shaman said that he always prefers to get the film already cut and chopped up and everything and then try to put music to it, which is what he did here. And technology was changing as far as like the sort of synthesizers with pre-programmed, like very uh, realistic sounding instruments as opposed to, you know, in the 70s and in the 80s, especially early 80s and late 70s and stuff, where if you were working with synths, it was more of like that, that wavy, bleepy, bloopy, like very futuristic-y type sound, as opposed to being very convincing in mimicking actual, you know, strings and things of that nature and, and whatever. And so, yeah, he just, him talking about how the music brings tension to certain scenes is really fascinating because it totally does. Most notably, the first time Sheldon uh, tries to escape from the room and actually just get out of the room where Annie is holding him hostage. And then also, also the climax little battle between the two of them at the very end. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous film. I've gushed about the creative process here. So let's just talk about a few of my favorite bits in the film. I'm sure you guys have a lot of them, but you know less than 20 minutes into the movie that Sheldon, it becomes very apparent that he is in a very dire situation because, you know, he finishes his book, he has his cigarette, he has his champagne, he goes and talks to Lauren Bacall, his agent, and, you know, he's, uh, I think that's a flashback, now that I think about it. It's a flashback to him finishing the final Misery book, Misery's Child, and then yeah, the stuff at the very beginning with him in this lodge in Colorado where he likes to go and finish his books and stuff. He has his smoke and his champagne, and he's driving from Colorado 
back to New York, or that's the intention at least, when he gets caught in the storm, wrecks his badass Mustang, and uh, hey, man, that tune at the beginning, like, ooh, man, I love it. It's a, some like swingy, like Motown, like doo-wop throwback, sort of like 50s, 60s stuff, man. Oh, I loved it. It's a, it's, it's a terrific song, killer, killer. But that uh, he's pulled from the wreckage and saved by none other than his number one fan. Yeah, I, uh, earlier in the days of Hail to Stephen King, uh, I, I got involved with a viewer of the show uh, who was a really sweet girl, really awesome, and uh, without naming names, hope, hope the best for her, brilliant and talented and all that stuff, but uh, when we first kind of got involved, she was like, I'm your number one fan, and it was a big joke between the two of us while we were dating, but watching this movie, it just kind of took me back. I'm like, ah, okay. But so, I mean, it was just a joke, obviously. So, uh, but in any event, less than 20 minutes in where she's trying to feed him some soup and she's feeding him all this hogwash about the roads being snowed over and phones not working and all this other stuff. And she has coerced him to uh, allow a look at his new manuscript for this untitled, uh, his first after capping off the, the series of misery books and whatnot. And Annie takes, uh, take some offense to this, uh, the racy language in this, and she has a whole cockamamie blah 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 effing whatever, and she starts flipping out, and she spills the soup on him, and then she's like, look what you made me do! And, uh, yeah, uh, just the look in Sheldon's eyes when she starts flipping out, he's just like, god damn. I am in quite the precarious position here with broken legs and, you know, uh, very, very badly injured. And this former nurse is nur she's nursing me back to health, but, you know, she's going to flip out and scream at him and then say, I love you. I, I mean, I, I, I love your mind. You're, I, I, I love your work. You're, you're brilliant. And she's like backpedaling a little bit. And just the look. James Kahn, the expressions on his face at various times in this story are just friggin' priceless, man. They are just utterly hilarious. And so, yeah, less than 20 minutes into the runtime, you know that he is in a bad way. Have to call out our, I think he's like the local, local sheriff of Silver Creek, Colorado, because there's a press conference later in the movie where they're addressing the fact that Sheldon is still missing. They found his vehicle. They don't know if he froze out there or if animals ate him or whatever. And uh, it's the person is described as the sheriff of Colorado. I know counties have sheriffs, but I, hey, I'm not here to scrutinize or anything like that, but uh, Richard Farnsworth, who was uh, a great actor, rest peacefully, uh, he does such a terrific job in this. He was a stuntman and an actor. Um, oh boy, he, I know he got an Academy Award nomination at least for The Straight Story, I think it was, in 1999, but he's great in this as like the, you know, well-meaning, grandfatherly, sort of dude who is much sharper than a lot of people may actually give him credit for because he is kind of piecing together all of these bits of information, you know, with some stuff that Annie does at the local general store, like buying paper and a typewriter and all this other stuff. Also, her well-known obsession with Paul Sheldon and buying up all his books. And so, the, you know, this, this law enforcement guy is like piecing things together, but he's got a really cute relationship with his wife who is played by uh, Frances Sternhagen. Uh, Sternhagen and uh, you know, they're driving around in the truck at one particular point earlier in the movie and she's like putting her hand on his leg and he's like, God damn it, I told you, when we're out on the job, you're not my wife, you're my deputy. And she's like, well, I'd like to be at home under the warm covers with the sheriff. And <laughs> it's just that sort of relationship is very, very endearing and, and very cute. And it's, uh, yeah, I, I like it. It's Those two characters are a great addition to kind of counterbalance, you know, the very toxic relationship between Paul and Annie. And so I, I really enjoy the addition of those two. Um, and then obviously Annie Wilkes with her pet pig, man, which believe it or not, in the earliest, uh, just like King putting this story together in his head before putting it down to proper paper, I think he was saying in on writing that he wrote down some ideas on some napkins on an airplane, but he originally was going to have Annie Wilkes feed Paul Sheldon to the pig. That's a Bachman ending if I've ever heard one. <laughs> but um, yeah, man, I mean... Annie Wilkes is such an amusing character. This film does have a lot of darkly comedic elements to it. The book, I don't think they really come out as much in the book, and you really needed a director like Rob Reiner in the fact that he could balance like the humor with the horror 
in some ways. And this isn't a horror film per se, it's definitely thriller through and through, but just those scary elements and the, those unsettling aspects, the fact that he had this background in the comedic and also had a father who was so prolific in that regard himself, I mean, it it gives that sort of just like, oh man, I don't know if I should be laughing at some of this stuff, but it's really funny. And just her, her cockamamie blah blah and calling Paul a dirty birdie, you know, for killing uh, Misery Chastain in Misery's Child. And that's really what sets into motion. It makes you wonder if she ever had any intention of letting him go or not, or if it really was a byproduct of him killing her beloved character. That's something that's debatable, I guess, you know? I mean, the world may never know, you know? It's like with uh, how many licks to get to the center of that Tootsie Pop, man. But, uh, yeah, and then she just forewarns him. She's like, I didn't call your agent or your daughter on her birthday, blah, blah, blah. And you better hope I don't die, because if I die, you die. And so that's where, I mean, things ramp up pretty quickly. And then, you know, Sheldon is just like, well, shit. What am I going to do here? What am I going to do? And the initial plan that he hatches, obviously, is that the pain pills that she is giving him, he starts hiding them in the mattress, and there's a point where he asks her as he's, you know, bringing misery back to life in this uh, Misery's Return, I believe is what it's called, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, yeah, he's like, he's like, will you have dinner with me? And so he's hatching his little master plan to try to, you know, just pour all of these painkillers into a beverage of hers and yet when he's attempting to do it and they're listening to the Liberace and she's like I'm gonna play all my Liberace records to inspire you and, <laughs> and there's so much Liberace throughout this movie but um yeah they're having this meal and you know he's like go get a candle and he pours his whole little paper thing full of the pain med powder into her wine and lo and behold she spills it and just the look Another expression of just pure pricelessness on Sheldon's face. Uh, you know, props to James Kahn, obviously. Jimmy Kahn, as they were calling him in, uh, in the, the supplemental material. But just the priceless expression, man, is just, is just perfect as he realizes, nope, that plan's not going to work. And uh, yeah, Annie, just the, the contrast of the moods and the, you know, going from the mania to the depression and those peaks and valleys and stuff of her bipolarness. I mean, when when she originally is like, nope, that's not gonna work, that's not gonna work, that's trickery, that's copping out, whatever. And then when Sheldon finally, you know, gets it and figures out a way to properly bring her back from, you know, the coma from the bee sting allergy and all this other stuff, and she's just so into it and she's like spinning around and she's so happy in the mania of that. But then like later on, when the rain is there and she's like, gives me the blues and just the sullen, just like staring off into space look on Kathy's face is just, what an actor. She just, she slays in this movie, man. And she just, it's a performance for the ages. It really, really is to have just all of those different nuances and, and just, I mean, being able to just ping pong back and forth between all those different emotions, I would imagine it's probably pretty taxing on her in some ways emotionally, but you know, the fact that she justifies his presence by saying that I prayed to God about this and God said that he delivered you to me so that I can show you the way and all that. And that shit is really, really creepy. And uh, where, where she implores him to burn his manuscript of that, his first attempt at trying to do something besides misery and so, so friggin' long. And she's like, help me help you. And just the look of absolute sadness and emptiness as he's burning his manuscript on the grill. That's a chilling scene. Um, it's amusing, the typewriter aspect. Anybody who has read the book or uh, seen this film knows just how funny it is that this nice typewriter she gets for him doesn't have an N, and so you're having to like write the ends in throughout the entire time. Um, man, I, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Sheldon's first escape with the little like bobby pin thing where he picks the lock and he goes out and he's like looking around, trying to survey the scene, trying to see if there's a working phone, all this different stuff. That, that shot is so tense from not just the music, from like the way it goes from longer cuts to like these shorter quick cuts, quick cuts, quick cuts, as Annie Wilkes is getting closer and closer to returning. And he is like trying his damnedest to get back into the room and then he just barely makes it. And she looks at him and she's like, you're, you're perspiring and blah, 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 what's wrong? And then he acts like he's fiending for his pills because he's in so much pain. But that is a terrifically shot scene, very tense, very well put together. I mean, thrilling, you know, edge of your seat sort of stuff, man. Um, 
One other thing that I didn't mention earlier that I think is kind of amusing is the fact that they just threw down, you know, uh, Kathy Bates for this role and, you know, it stuck and it was great and everything, like, right in the middle of the audition, like, just a few lines in, Reiner mentions uh, in some of the supplemental stuff that, yeah, he knew immediately she had the job. However, casting Sheldon was very difficult. In fact, they tried, like, almost a dozen different people that they offered the role to and all of them turned it down. Listen to this list of names. William Hurt turned it down. Kevin Klein turned it down. Michael Douglas turned it down. Harrison Ford turned it down. Dustin Hoffman turned it down. Robert De Niro turned it down. Al Pacino turned it down. Ricky Dreyfus turned it down. Gene Hackman turned it down. Robert Redford turned it down. Warren Beatty was apparently going to do it, but he ended up having scheduling conflicts with Dick Tracy right around the same time, and so he ended up having to drop out. So the dozenth, the twelfth person in James Caan was the one who ended up actually getting the role, and uh, yeah, I thought that that was just in incredibly interesting, you know? But aside from that earlier uh, moment of tension when he attempts his first escape from the room, another scene that I obviously have to mention, which is probably what is the most enduring and frightening sequence in the entire film, is the ankle breaking, the uh, hobbling, as they call it. And in the book, everybody knows at this particular point, Probably, Pro probably, I can't say everybody knows, but those in the know, like the more keen Psy King fans, whether on film or in literature or both, um, CRs, noobs, whatever it may be, um, it's pretty common knowledge at this particular point that in the source material, it is a uh, ax that is taken to uh, his uh, legs instead of a hammer. And so in the film, we break the ankles and in the book, his, uh, the halves of his legs are chopped off with an axe, and it was apparently a deliberate decision by the filmmakers, because it was in the original script to use the axe and hack him off. But they're like, you know, we want people to kind of feel bad for Annie Wilkes, at least to a degree. Even though, like, I don't understand how you can feel bad for somebody who, when, you know, Sheldon looks through the, the, the memory book, and he sees all the newspaper clippings that, you know, she killed the uh, co-workers, she killed her first husband, she killed all of these, like, infants, these newborns in the various hospitals, and they didn't have enough evidence to, to convict her. So, she is one sick puppy, and yet still, I guess, they wanted, you know, she's, she's mentally ill. And so, if somebody is just that mentally ill, and has this bipolar, has this sadomasochism, uh, all these different things, um, you're supposed to at least, you know, just, I don't know, feel bad, sympathetic, whatever. And so for that reason, they decided to hobble, to break the ankles instead. And that's one of the bits that Nicotero talks about in the supplemental material, is them making these, like, sleeves for the grossly broken and, like, you know, swollen legs, which is pretty cool. And yet also doing that beat with the sledgehammer to the ankle and just the foot bending and the very incredibly realistic fake foots that they made. You only see one of the foot breaks in the film, but they did shoot both of them. And so Nicotero's like, oh, I wanted to see both, but he realized that this film wasn't trying to be gratuitous. And so one was enough and just seeing Sheldon's expression and reaction to this happening, it just sold it enough. And what sells it even more so is after effing him up so badly, what does she look at him and say? God, I love you. You know, and it's just, it's very unsettling. Very unsettling. That is for damn sure, man. Another unsettling aspect is where our super sleuth sheriff guy finally puts all the pieces together and shows up at Annie Wilkes' farm and takes a shotgun blast to the chest, man. And it is very realistically done and very unexpected. It's another one of those like big shocker moments that uh, there's. I, I mean, the big three are the fight at the end that I already mentioned, the shotgun blast, and the hobbling. Those are like the three just most like catch you off guard with their craziness, sort of violent moments where the film veers from thriller into, in a lot of ways, straight up horror, you know? And that final battle, man, I mean, damn yo, it goes from a typewriter to the head to him taking the Misery Returns manuscript that he has burned, and like, as they're rolling around fighting and like, wrestling, and you know, it's almost like a weird sexualness to it. You know, like, the like, very angry sex rolling around in a bed, sort of like, you know, I, I don't know, I'm sure 
A lot of us have been in that sort of position, <laughs> but um, he's taking the ashes of the manuscript and like stuffing them in her mouth and rubbing them in her face, and that's after he's already tried to thumb out her eyeballs, and it's a pretty grisly confrontation at the end. And he's already smashed her in the head with that fatty friggin' typewriter, and then he finally finishes the deed with that pig because, you know, she's got that pet pig and she has all of these like, these little pig statues and ceramics, and man, Annie Wilkes is just one weird ass woman, man. I mean, sitting eating her, her junk food, her, you know, Coca-Cola and her Cheetos and stuff while she's in bed watching like the dating games and stuff like that. Like, you just, you just tell, man, that, that she's just not right. And it becomes obviously more and more apparent as the film goes on and stuff. And yeah, at the very end, <laughs> he's stuffing the ashes into her mouth and stuff. And he's like, eat it, you sick, twisted fuck. And I'm just like, oh, get it, Sheldon, you know, but at, at the very end of it, you know, even after he's finally escaped and stuff, and he's sitting with uh, with his agent at the very end, and she's like, "Would you ever think about writing a book about this?" And he's like, "He's like, do you really want to, you know, have me just drag out all the most traumatic experience of my life so you can make a few bucks? That's pretty messed up." But he thinks he sees Annie at the end of the film pushing the dessert cart around at this like poshy restaurant in uh, New York City, presumably, and uh, it just shows that. She's gonna be with him forever. He has been mentally scarred and it's never gonna go away. Annie Wilkes messed him up for life, man. And uh, yeah, that is some that is some real shizzle. And uh, yeah, I mentioned uh, the fact that she Golden Globes and Oscars and all that different stuff. But uh, she also, the character of Annie Wilkes as portrayed by Kathy Bates, ranked number 17 in the American Film Institute's 100 Years, 100 Heroes and Villains. So she was in the top 20. That shows just the notoriety and uh, the infamy, I would say, of the Annie Wilkes character as portrayed by Kathy Bates. Um, yeah, most definitely a performance for the ages. And another thing that I have to mention, and I've been planning this for quite a while, I just, uh, I think I'm finally gonna get around to it sometime in early 2021, is the fact that there was a Indian Bollywood remake of this entitled Julie Ganapathy. And I think I'm gonna do a double down of that along with the uh, the No Smoking, which was basically a uh, Indian remake, uh, the country of India. Of, uh, of Quitters Incorporated. And then there was also a 50-something episode TV version called Wa? Whoa? Whoa? Wa? I don't know. W-O-H uh, of It. So I think I need to finally get around to just... I don't know if I'm going to be able to find all of those episodes of that television series, but both uh, the remake of Misery and the remake of Quitters Inc. are available on um, this uh, Bollywood streaming service that's on Amazon. So I'm gonna check both of those out. And uh, un unfortunately, the uh, the Julie Ganapati is not subtitled. So I guess thankfully I know the story, you know, uh, like the back of my hand. What the hell is that? Uh, so I think I'll be able to follow it at least well enough. And I'm curious to see just a different take, just like I really wish I could see that stage version with Laurie Metcalf and Bruce Willis. But really, once more, just to double down, uh, we would not have all of those iterations of this classic Psy King novel from 1987 if not for the fact that we had this performance for the ages from Kathy Bates, a great turn from James Caan, and uh, once again, I mean, Rob Reiner, William Goldman, uh, Barry Sonnenfeld, Mark Shaman's terrific music, and obviously the great, uh, great performance from those two actors. This is iconic for a reason. What are your thoughts on Misery? Do you think it's one of the best Psyching adaptations ever? Let me know in the comments below your thoughts on this spoiler review and some of the points that I made. Please make points of your own if you have them. Uh, I have been Jaime Fuego and y'all can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on the YouTubies where I do also have my own personal YouTube channel. It's called Infuegotainment. If you migrate over there, a like, a share, and a subscribe to some of the stuff, whether it's the uh, Bordai subsequent movie film or whether it's uh, On the Rocks, the new Sofia Coppola. I also did reviews of the AMC Soulmates television series recently. Um, probably various other stuff here in the month of November because I'm filming this a few weeks ahead of time so that I don't have to do it Thanksgiving weekend, but which is when you're going to be viewing this. And uh, also, uh, just to let you know, the book of the month here in November is none other than The Bizarre Bad Dreams. Uh, for its five-year anniversary, we are doing the next book of the month on the first Saturday of December 
all about that terrific collection of short stories. Um, and that is in conjunction with the Hail to Stephen King Facebook group. Uh, we have almost a thousand members there, a very closely knit quartet where we talk Psy King every day of the week, lots of terrific palaver. On Fridays, we kind of freak out a little bit and I let y'all have uh, just any sort of discussion as long as it is cordial and cool. And uh, yeah, that's about the extent of it, everybody. So uh, thank you so very much once again. Danke, arigato, merci, muito grazie. And until the Wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, San amigos, constant readers and viewers alike, say thank you for spending a little time with me today. I'm hopeful we share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. And until that occurs, remember to stay scared and read. Stephen King, always read Stephen King. If you haven't read Misery, you definitely need to read it. But yes, in this instance, I do really recommend to watch Stephen King.